me. Aww. Aww. <laughs> 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 Guys, uh, this is the full metal album. This panel, you probably knew that. <laughs> this is not Inu Yasha. <laughs> That's next door. <laughs> uh, why don't we get down the Why don't we get down the table here and say hi and who we are and stuff? Hey, guys, I'm Colleen Lincoln Beard. Five times. 
times older than Edward Elric. <laughs> oh, it's a bad, it's a bad one. It's one of those big ones. It's a landmark one. Guys, can you? No. That's a good thing. Maybe my mom will buy me a Volkswagen. What is your question, oh horned one? What does Edward Elric like? Yeah. Edward Elric loves milk. Duck Bill Platypus. <laughs> duck Bill Platypuses. <laughs> or is it Platypi? Platypi. Not sure. I've only ever seen one, one, so it was just Pie is always better. Um, I, I've always been a big fan of Duck Bill Platypuses. <laughs> I was in Australia a couple of months ago for a convention, and we all went to the zoo on one free day. And I was like, yeah, elephant, whatever. You know? Oh, look, <laughs> a koala, right? <laughs> then we came around the corner. They had duckbill platypuses! <laughs> I loved it, I was so excited. They're so crazy looking, you know? But that's my favorite. Do you know they're famous? <laughs> they actually are. No, really? They have venomous, the true story, they have venomous, like, spikes. On the inside of their legs that they use to kill with. Isn't it just, isn't it just that way with every cute thing? <laughs> like you, you're probably venomous. Yes. Thank Did you, you know the leading cause of oh leprosy God. in America is armadillos? <laughs> what? Not, I'm kidding. And by leading cause, I mean like all four cases. But still, <laughs> armadillos. Are, Are you leprosy. serious? Yes. So don't pick one of them. <laughs> Oh, you wanted all of us to answer that, didn't you? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we have the question. Go ahead, guys. Yeah, What's your answer? What, what animal would you think about? I think... For Scar? <laughs> I think... I just... I never... I don't know a specific animal, like, specific breed, but I always picture, like, on the really, really rough days, I like to picture Scar just rolling around in a pit of puppies. <laughs> Just to take the edge off. Just like, oh, so cute. You're just gonna have to break yours. Oh, that's totally what he does to one line. Um, if Lon Fon's favorite animal would probably be a lock dragon. Ooh. Anybody? Sorry. See, look at that. Come on, not poor people. Google it. <laughs> You're young, because it's never ending. Hey, Tina, guess what? Guess who was in Australia for two weeks with me? A tray you. <laughs> That's a pretty good The thing. actor that uh, Noah Hathaway who played a tray you and never an extra. My very first crush of my life. I know. Betrayed. You and my girl and every other female. Oh, more than that. He's amazing. He was the coolest guy ever. Yeah, he's 40 now. <laughs> I got no qualms, right? No qualms. <laughs> what about you, Kelly? Uh, well, Hawkeye gets a bad rap for pointing that gun at uh, Black Panther. But, uh, I think dogs, I mean, come on, dogs. She's a little strict. She does it because she cares. That's right. <laughs> What's your question, baby girl? Oh, yeah. Um, if you had a favorite line, um, could you maybe, like, like, if you had a favorite line, could you say it? Like, each one of you? What if you didn't have a favorite line? Um, From Full Metal Alchemist or any show? Oh. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, you know your flame attack is useless in the rain. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna need a minute. <laughs> you go ahead. I, 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 ha I have one. I have one, but I have to. I have to do the, the the aftermath that you didn't get to hear because it wasn't kept. But um, I was so excited to play Scar in Brotherhood that oh. his first line. You know this story. His very first, like, big line, which is, you know, pretty good when he was like, 
foolish alchemists who turn their backs on the ways of God shall be punished. Is originally followed by me going. <laughs> Moment broke my heart so much 
that I rapidly learned to stop getting too attached. Not that I didn't love them, but I didn't ever expect them to be safe. Because if Nina's not safe, nobody's safe, right? So I, I think that count. moment, that it's like it's like watching, um, watching or, or reading Game of Thrones. Like when you, you learn when you're not gonna get attached. Yeah. <laughs> so that was get too attached. Um, having been blessed uh, to come in uh, to this franchise during Brotherhood, uh, because Lone Pond obviously came in during Brotherhood. Yeah. Uh, sure. Doesn't matter. Woo! And then, yeah. um, so I think it's kind of the same thing, like knowing knowing the scale of Brotherhood and being able to come in and, and work with such great people and everything. Um, I. I, I learned very quickly, like, this is my one thing, and if I can just focus on Lon Fawn and make sure that works out, everything else will fall into place. And so I, I was pretty selective about just focusing on that character, and because and, um, otherwise I'd be like, what? What just happened? I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to do it right now. I'm not, I'm not feeling like I can go in. <laughs> know what the F that was. <laughs> that was wrong. <laughs> yeah, so that. You're yeah. up on all seven. I'm up. Um, well, you know, I, I purposefully didn't read it ahead of time because I kind of didn't want to know what was going to happen. Because if you think about it, the, the characters, let's assume the characters are real. They don't know what's about to happen, right? right? So he, every corner they go around, every, every, every new piece of information is new to them. So there's something kind of organic about, as an actor, learning about it and spontaneously, uh, you know, organically reacting as if uh, you just found out just like the character did. So there were a lot of those moments, I never read ahead, but when we were in the studio actually recording, there were a lot of those moments, in the first series especially, where I would be like, you know, I'd read a line getting ready to do it, or we would watch a scene, Colleen would be, directing and we would watch a scene through and I'd be like oh. and Colin would be like do you want to take a minute? I'm like no let's do it now while it's, you know what I mean? let's record it now while it's I can vouch for the fact that Vic cried twice every session <laughs> <laughs> I'm, hey listen it's true I loved it I loved it um, so I mean that's one of the reasons that I'm such a fan of Full Metal too because I had done 40 or 50 shows before Full Metal and nothing ever grabbed me the way Full Metal did. I just, there was something about it that really, really hit me. So almost every time after about episode eight, every time Ed was like in tears about something, I was in tears about something. So there were plenty of those moments. How about you? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of with you about, you know, just trying to keep um, away from it until you're recording so it will be more organic and natural in the booth because you're reacting to it as they are reacting to it. But I, but I knew the story because, I mean, I was a big fan of series, um, which wrapped before I was a voice actor, and so getting to be a brother was a big, you know, <gasps> moment for me. <laughs> and, uh, I, I knew Scar's story, I knew where he was coming from, and I knew what was going to happen, because I'd also read uh, quite a bit of the manga until my department was like, you should stop. <laughs> Why don't you know what's happening? Yeah. He kept me pretty much, even like the last session, he's like, this is your last session, do you want to know whether you live or die? No. Nope. <laughs> Don't want to know. Don't want to know. I'm gonna find out as you do it, and so that was great. But but for me, like the big moment with uh, with Scar, because Scar is usually just being a you know badass the whole time. So it's like you don't get emotional so much; you're just angry all the time. But the, his his backstory when he wakes up in the tent and he's like, oh brother, oh god, like that. <laughs> that just hit me in a way, and I had a little freak out in the booth and got and I did, we did the, I mean you know an actor freak out, not like I'm like I can't do this, like, you know. You know <laughs> I got it; just was very real for me because of. Of, uh, because I kept away from it and just having it happen, it was like, oh my god, I'm like, oh, no, he's not, he's you, no, like, he's your own. And that freaked me out, and so I, like, ah, uh, I had a little, and with Scar, it was weird because you can't emote that much because he's not a crier. <laughs> and we never see him rolling around with puppies. <laughs> just, you know, kind of, you know, cause your, you know, your perception to change, so they want to keep that off stage stuff. So I would, I would leave a uh, session, you know, having done Scar for like two or three hours or so, and then I would just be like exhausted, and I would have a nice little cry in the car on the way home, because it's a tough story to watch him go through. I mean, you're like, God, everybody goes through hell in that show. <laughs> I'm like, oh, man. So yeah, but definitely, when he wakes up in the tent. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Hi, my name is Sarah, and I just want to say I'm a big fan and I love all you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. We love you. <laughs> and um, my question is just, I think you partially answered this question already, but what are like your favorite bloopers from the Fennel Alchemist series? <laughs> Oh, 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 I'm starting. Okay, yeah. My favorite. Sorry, not there yet. You start. Okay. My favorite blooper is, of course, the, the whole shake weight. It's a JMP there. It's perfect. And it fit the flaps. I'm like, that worked. Oh my god, that worked. Like, it's so clever. <laughs> my favorite blooper wasn't really a blooper. It was uh, what we like to refer to affectionately as little bombs that voice actors leave for other actors. We had just started Brotherhood. I was so eager to hear Maxie Whitehead. I mean, I love Aaron as if I had a little brother. If I had one, I would want Aaron to be my little brother. And I was, you know, I was sad for him that he, you know, grew up and he wasn't able to do the voice anymore. So I was really eager to hear Maxie, how she sounded. Um, I knew that a lot of work went into picking the right person for that role. And she, I heard she was amazing, but I didn't know what she sounded like yet. So there's this one scene in one of the very first episodes where Ed and Al are walking away from Winry, and Winry yells out, oh, oh, yes. <laughs> Winry yells out, hey, don't forget to come back for dinner. Uh, Annie Panaco's making stew. And Alphonse turns around, Alphonse turns around in two big wide flaps. Yay, stew! Right? I'd never heard Maxie before. So I'm so excited to listen to her do this, right? And so I'm getting ready, because, and then right after Al speaks, Ed goes, yeah, whatever. He's like, like he's, you know, maybe we'll come home, maybe not, kind of thing. So I'm supposed to sing my line right after Al says hymns. So we're going, boop, boop, boop. And right on that fourth beat, I'm getting ready to say my line, and I hear Al's line. And this is what I heard. Hey, don't forget to come home for dinner. Andy Panaco's making stew. Boop. for the first time I just started dying laughing and gave her a big hug so she's, she immediately endeared herself to me. That is now my favorite blooper. <laughs> I love it, that, that's awesome. Maxie is like the nicest, sweetest, sweetest girl ever and she would She's not, she doesn't hurt. She and she's little tiny. Tiny, itty bitty. So yeah. hurt, like physically, against the laws of nature. That's awesome. That's a really great, that was, I'm going to go with that one. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite blooper actually made it into the show. So uh, when you hear, when you hear Mustang say, I love dogs, he was joking. <laughs> Him from more than yeah. any other yeah. line. Yeah. Isn't that funny? That's, I love it. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Sarah, right? Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Katie Baby. Thank you. So before I ask my question, I just want to say thank you so much for creating something so special, and I think it means a lot to everyone, the Full Metal Alchemist series. So thank you for that. And for the Your characters were thrown into something similar to the Hunger Games. So, uh, if all four of you were thrown into an arena to the battle of the death, who do you think would win? And who do you think? Absolutely, Riza. Scar would die first because we would all gang up on it because everybody would think Scar would win. Yeah. <laughs> so we make it to the cardigan. The Copy first, whatever that is. Yeah, yeah. and, and Scar has to put up with. <laughs> 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 I 
be so small. Ed wouldn't win because he's too nice. He'd want to save other people. No, well, actually, what would happen is Ed and Winry and Al would attend the uh, the ceremony where they pull the name, yeah. and they would pull Ed's name, and Winry would step and go, I offer myself this tribute! She's a girl, she's a That's what happened in the movie. No, 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 no. Thank you for your question. I would not want to go into the Hunger Games with, Lon with, uh, with Lane, because he would eat everything. <laughs> He's always hungry. <laughs> uh, hello, panel. Uh, just want to say I'm a huge fan of both series, but uh, I like so much Joey Colleen, so how do you? What happened? Uh, how are you? Ah, yeah. Uh, questions about uh, both series. How did uh, you and Vic uh, work with the characters, change them for the second series, and some plenty of different stuff happens? Yeah. Also, uh, Jane Michael, how was it uh, taking over someone like else's else former like character and making it your own? And uh, that's probably not common among a lot of uh, work uh, for another English actor to have something for you. And also, Trina, uh, uh, how was it working on it? Good. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I think. I think mostly um, the difference in my character was voice, was vocally, when I started doing Riza for Full Metal Alchemist, that was one of the first characters I played, like one of the first five that I'd ever played. Uh, and so I couldn't really achieve much of a low voice. Uh, and then by the time we got back around to Brotherhood, I'd done Yuko and Mama and a whole bunch of others. Like that was, uh, so I, I, got low really, really quickly and really easily, and Mike kept reminding me that it was not supposed to be the bottom of my range anymore because that's not where Riza sat originally. But it was nice to be able to make the difference between Rose and Riza that much more substantial uh, because the first time around I just didn't have that kind of range, and, and now I can definitely differentiate between the two a lot easier. So vocally it was a lot easier, and it was nice to have uh, Riza's back story. <laughs> 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 you know what they would probably find interesting too is that when you voiced Rose, you didn't realize she was going to come back at the end. Yeah, when we when we started uh, Full Metal, it wasn't done. I mean, we just didn't know what was going to happen at the end, and so Rose, I thought, was just a one-off character. I thought she was around for a couple of episodes, and we had to get those episodes done. They were almost out the door, and we cast somebody as Rose, and it just didn't work out. And so we decided, I'll just jump in there, do Rose, it'll be over. You won't be able to tell the difference between me and Rita, it'll be fine. And she came back. Um, and as far as playing, playing the character in both series, I was really kind of scared. Uh, when I heard that there was a, a new series, when I heard that they were doing Brotherhood, I thought, Really? Well, yeah. I mean, after the first series came out so good, yeah. you know? It's like when you're in a little league team and you hit a home run, the next time you come up to bat, what does everybody expect you to do? Yeah. Home run. Get another home run. And, and there were so many things that had to come together to make the first series what it was, you know? The music, and the directing, and the writing, the acting. We were the, the series animation. wasn't going to be as good coming out of Japan. I definitely sure. Had well, yeah, concerns. we would do the best we could, but there was just no way to know. And yeah. so I was pretty, I was pretty worried actually when, when we first were getting ready to start. But uh, but as soon as we got into it, uh, just I mean literally within 20 minutes or 30 minutes of starting the first episode, my favorite part was that I didn't look at it as a whole new thing. I kind of had it in my mind like it would. Like it could be retitled The Further Adventures of the Full Metal Alchemist, you know what I mean? It was new stuff. Ed gets to go to new places, he gets to meet new people, he gets to put on other clothes. <laughs> I mean, new things, and so for That's me... It's really interesting, because I, I felt looked at it as a whole different thing, like not a continuation, but a very separate series that follows the manga instead. Sure. That's really fascinating. Sure, but for me, I just, I, 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 I don't know why, it's just that I kind of... I, I, you know what it was? Because my favorite things that I looked forward to in Brotherhood were the new things. 
You know what I mean? Uh, certain plot points and story things that we knew already from the original series, I'm like, okay, yeah, I know what happens here. Who's that? <laughs> What's that guy? This, what is this, Xerxes? Oh my gosh. I mean, all of these new places and new relationships that Ed was forming with these other characters, these new characters, those were my favorite parts. So it was like broadening the world, um, you know, that they lived in. So. Uh, yeah, as, as far as um, getting to, to take over a role that, you know, that uh, was originated by someone else and that who's, who's, who's version of it is well loved, um, including by myself, because I love uh, Amy Clark's performance as Scar. Um, as I said earlier, I was a big fan of the first series, um, but it wrapped uh, about a year, I think, before I really got into the industry. And uh, true story, my at that point, I, I was an extra, like a total like a guard who gets shot and dies. It's not full drain. It's just full drain. And uh, like the conqueror of Trombala, right? And when I went home, you better believe when I went home from that session, which were very early days for me uh, in my career, I was like, oh my god, I gotta be careful. I'm like, I'm so much <laughs> <laughs> Like, just yay, skipping home. And so, so like five, six years later, you know, by that time, I'm, I'm you know, more established and I've done quite a few things. And then, you know, Mike comes to me and, and uh, there was like the. It was like the one-off of the chibi head OVA thing, right? Where uh, Scar had like a line, and, and uh, Damien Clark couldn't come in for that because he lives like way out on the other side of, of you know, the, of the, the states. And uh, so Mike was like, well, you can, you know, why don't you try this? You've got kind of a low, gravelly voice, and yeah, let's, let's try that. So we did, and because it was silly, it was fine. No one cared, no one really noticed, and, and that's fine. And then a couple of years later, when, when Brotherhood came down the wire, and for whatever reason, uh, Clark couldn't couldn't take the role up again, and so Mike said, hey, Tato. <laughs> and Mike is a very good friend of mine. We've worked together on a lot of things, and he's he's all about, as a director, he loves to push me outside of my comfort zone, and he's, uh, he's frequently, whenever I discover a new voice, um, or something about my range I didn't know, it's it's typically, he's he's one of the directors that, that's responsible for getting me there. And so, you know, he, I was, he comes to me and says, do you want to play Scar? But I'm like, uh, I'm not, uh, I, I kind of freaked out about it because I mean, that is a, a hell of a responsibility to have put on you. I mean, you understand, we already, all of us in this industry have the pressure of, you know, having to build off of, uh, a, I mean, the audience we're trying to reach are people that already often have a very profound relationship with these characters before we ever get our hands on it because they've watched the Japanese and they know the Sega's work very well and where they, well they should. And we try to build off of that and kind of enlarge upon it in our own way. Um, but there's a very fine line between, you know, doing something that's true and organic and just imitating what's come before because you want everyone to like it and you, you try to anticipate every problem everyone can conceivably have to it. That's death to an act. You can't do it. Um, and so Mike just said, look, this is going to be your scar. This is going to be Different series. It's based on the manga. Yes, you can. You can. If you want to study, you know, go back and look at the original stuff and study. They make Clark stuff. It's fine. But I don't want you to sound like that. I want you to sound like your Scar. We're going to do something. We're going to do different with them. And it's just because I think we've got room to play because of the way he's presented in the series is slightly different, just different enough to justify a new voice. And so I, I really credit. I think everything about that performance that works, I credit to Mike McFarlane's direction of me because I was really terrified. And, and I, I was very, very lucky to have not only a great director to work with, but an awesome cast. I usually got to record after they laid down track. So once everyone's there, it's like, oh, this is great. This feels like I'm in a room with people and I can just be myself. And, you know, roll around and help exactly. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good question. Hello. Um, now, obviously, you guys are really close with doing the two shows and stuff like that. But if you're doing like a, a new show where you ne necessarily don't know everybody on the cast, and obviously you guys record by yourselves, like, how do you guys usually interact and get together, and then obviously become close friends? Because you know if you're starting out, like Michael just said he was, you know, if he came to Brotherhood and not necessarily knowing people, you know, how do you guys become close friends if, even though you don't actually work together? Well, the reality is, it's conceivable that we wouldn't even meet each other. Yeah. Literally, wouldn't meet each other unless one's leaving while the other is coming or we get booked into a convention together. Yep. Most of the friendships that, that have been forged have been from getting booked into conventions and hanging out, doing panels or, you know, uh, being at the same event together. And uh, there are people I've never met to this day. The woman that played Trisha Elric, my mom, I've never met her. Michael and I are 
of lucky because we both directed for Funimation, and I yeah. still do. So I get to meet, I mean, everybody that I'm in the shows with, I'm probably directing in something else. So there's friendships that form there. And sometimes those friendships form other friendships because we, call, we pull people yeah. together. Yeah. Uh, so that's definitely happened in the past. But it is conceivable. I mean, Chuck Hubert just came in uh, to the booth a couple of days ago and was like, I just met Gwendolyn Lau. I cannot believe I've never met her before. They've been working together forever. Yeah. Uh, and somebody else that he's worked with on Dragon Ball Z, and they just never met over a decade of work, and they've never met. And yeah, that definitely happens. I spent the whole D and Angel commentary just kind of geeking out that I was meeting Kevin Korn, who played Daisuke to my dark, and we'd done all these shows together, and the first time we met was when we came together for the commentary. Yeah. So we didn't even talk about the show much. We we're just like, wow, so what do you do? And like, yeah, who are you? Good question. Thank you. Maybe asking for a dash definition by saying this. The only other episode I've seen is the very first episode of Full Metal Alchemist. We just wrote a lot of stuff for you. <laughs> 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 We're missing out. The question I have is, what do you feel is the most awesome thing about Full Metal Alchemist that you can tell me that would pretty much make me want to see this season? Uh -huh. Oh, I got this one, guys. I totally got this one. All right, close your eyes. Raise your hand if you like Full Metal Alchemist. Okay, now open them. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's probably a pretty good reason. <laughs> that was a, that was great, right? I was going to get something from around. You told me to raise hands. Guys, they are the most fun people in the world. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Thank you so much, sweetie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored. I know, right? Adorable. Absolutely adorable. Uh, I was wondering, I had, I was wondering if you could say a line to me, Charlie. I'm sorry, Dick. Sorry. You're fine. It's okay. So there are worse people than you say. So Mike was always very careful to uh, only have me in on days to do Scar's voice when I wouldn't have anything else to do. Because I couldn't do Sebastian after yeah. voicing Scar. I couldn't do anything after Scar. Go home and drink lots and lots of orange juice. What's that? Were you doing it at the same time? Like, oh. uh, there was a little bit of overlap, I think, in the first season of, of Black Butler and, and, and Scar. So there was. But I mean, it's also kind of what we do. I mean, we go in the booth and, you know, we, we, uh, and I, I we do not see the scripts until we are literally in the booth performing and that's part of the skill set we have to develop as, as voice actors in this business is you know we, we just have to read and watch and you know you just learn to you know and it helps the longer you're performing on a character you kind of get to know them very well so you're kind of already in character before you get into the booth and then the music and the animation all of that's there to help you kind of get in there and just kind of gives you a framework for the lines you're being given but um yeah and you, and you just kind of one of the things you learn is to how to just kind of slough that character off if, and have to go down the hallway to another studio and become another character. It's it's uh, it's it happens all the time. It's just part of it's part of what you do. Um, they're all kind of on free rotation. All the characters you play in your head kind of become a permanent part of your psyche, and you just kind of keep them in there like all these psychotic rolodex. <laughs> and so when you're done with one character, you're like okay, let's go play the <laughs> It's hard to do, but, but it's it's part of the fun, really. When we go see now later, it's gonna be really fun for somebody to watch. <laughs> well, that's kind of part of being an actor. That's the fun part, is to get cast as something that's different and new and, and, and challenging in some way. You know, it's it's if you just played like the same person or played yourself all the time, it wouldn't be much of a challenge. But to get to, to play a character when you walk in and like, I want you to do this, and you're like, oh, really? <laughs> but it's new. It's different. It's a I'm a maniac, or yeah. some sort of weird, you know, thing, or it's a different kind of a, a voice for you. So those are one of the most fun parts about being a voice actor is getting the versatility and the variety of things. <laughs> things that you would never get to do as a screen actor. Do you ever think about that? One of the fun things about being a voice actor is we get to play roles that we would never be cast as on screen. Right. I would not generally be cast as a teenage boy pirate made of rubber. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but honestly, there's, there's, I, I can feel like it's easier to go back and forth. Do you, do you feel that way to go back and forth between two characters that are widely differentiated? Plus, 
playing Luffy and playing Yuko from Holic in the same day is easier than playing Yuko and playing some other large breasted <laughs> because it's it's too difficult to uh, find where they where they're separate if that makes sense. Whereas Luffy is like, oh, this is right here, so I can go to him quickly. Uh, and yeah, so sometimes the personalities will merge if your if your voices are too similar. Good question. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. 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 Deep breath, baby girl. <laughs> Into the nose, out through the mouth. You're good. You're both friends. Um, my name is Paige. Hi, Paige. Hi, Paige. Hi. I know you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you had. <laughs> Start aspiring words of wisdom for Paige and other voice actor vocals. I, I, I mean, we can. Uh, it's it's a it's a tricky business to get into, as all the creative jobs are. Those are the jobs everybody wants. So, I think the the two pieces of advice that I can give you that are kind of broad enough to help, I guess, in any situation is is one, cast your net as widely as possible. If you want to be a voice actor, to focus on the acting part. So, learn how to be an actor, and that means you know support yourself by doing all sorts of acting, so do stage work, whatever comes your way, basically. Don't, don't, um, the, the, the business is very competitive, and the more niche you get, the harder it is going to be to get your foot in the door, let alone make a living at it, if you do. So, don't say I want to be a voice actor, and don't say I want to be a dumb voice actor. If it happens, and it comes your way, by all means, take it, but be an actor, and that will broaden your scope a great deal. Saying you want to be a dumb voice actor is kind of like saying you want to go to architecture school for seven years so you can design um, hotel room bathroom doors. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, that's just kind of how it, it's been. Most of us found our way into this industry because we were actors in other ways first and then just kind of found our, our niche or our, our success in, in this thing. That's, and that's, that's funny. You have to kind of keep yourself open to all sorts of possibilities. Everyone kind of tells you, you know, bring, you know, follow your passion, follow your passion. And I, I disagree with that. I think you should bring your passion with you so that you can find Aww, yourself fulfilled lovely. in whatever you happen to find yourself doing. Um, also understand that it takes a great deal of luck, a great deal of luck. And you could be enormously talented and enormously dedicated and if luck just isn't on your side, it won't happen. And that's an unfortunate truth. But the other piece of advice I can give you is I've, I've I've noticed in my own, you know, ramblings that, that luck tends to favor the humble. So if you do ever get a chance to audition or, or make contacts with people or go to workshops or school or anything like that, use the time wisely, be humble about it, be easy to work with, be professional, be a nice person. Because too many people look at it as they want to be famous, and that's just another way of saying I want to be able to be a douchebag. <laughs> Be a nice person and then be an actor. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's really good advice, you guys. Yeah. The very last point that, you know, the point that I was going to throw in, and that is, um, just uh, you know, most of you guys have some talent, some creative talent that you enjoy doing. Maybe you, you sing, or you draw pictures, or you make costumes, or you write stories, paint, whatever. And you don't do them because somebody pays you. You do it because you love it, because you just have to do it. And probably at some point in all of our lives, we started acting and performing just because we loved it. Yeah. Not because we thought we were going to be famous, or not because we thought we would make a lot of money yep. at all, but because it just we had to let it out. It was something we enjoyed doing. So look for opportunities to do that. Whether or not it's like a paying thing or a popularity thing, look for ways to, to use those skills and to develop those skills community theater, school productions, church productions, things that can develop those skills and allow you to let those gifts shine. And then if the opportunity arises for you to do something in a professional venue, you're ready because you've been working on those skills all that time. But you know, I, I, passion is very important. But, you know, find the talents that you have and, and take any opportunity to develop them. Fine. I would absolutely agree with both points, or both both of these gentlemen. They're they're very very smart. Um, one of the things that I've found, I've been acting since I was nine years old, and it's a it's a very 
it's a very tough business. It's a very difficult thing to do, whether you're doing it professionally or you know, even in your community theater. Um, a big part of, uh, with those two major points, or three, four, those major points made. Um, another thing that I would say is develop some real thick skin, Mama. Like it is not, it is not an easy business, and most professional actors, or even community theater actors, or kids that do high school theater, you know, you're going to be turned down a lot. A lot of people are going to tell you no, and a lot of people aren't necessarily telling you no because you're not good enough. You just weren't right. So there will be times. I mean, I'm happy if I audition for seven, eight things, and I get one. Like, that's great. Like, as long as I'm striking in, as, like, you're going to strike out more than you strike in. And does that even, I don't, I, I don't know much about football balls, but that's <laughs> uh, sport, but your sports ball, balls, I don't know. I mean, I know about balls. <laughs> And as long as you're, you know, you're true to yourself, you're true to your dream, and you're true to your passion, I think that things happen for people that work hard, and I think that you could do that, Paige. All of that, plus, uh, creativity can't happen in a vacuum, and I know so many more people who have gotten themselves involved technically in something that they love to do creatively, so behind the camera work, or working a PA for somebody else's project, or engineering at a studio. I've known, I've known so many people who have gotten involved in the rest of the business by getting their foot in the door that way, that I feel like it's almost more important to, to make yourself aware of every aspect of what it is that you love. Because the more that you are, are good at within the whole sphere, the more possibility there is that you can be involved in more projects. And the more projects you're involved in, the more people you're gonna meet who are involved in, and will get involved in other projects and invite you to be involved in those. And that will get you where you want faster. And it will also teach you what you want. Because I didn't know this was what I was gonna be doing. And now I don't wanna do anything else. Aww. And it's just because I stumbled into it because I knew somebody who was in a play with me, Laura Bailey was in a play with me, and we were good friends, and so she brought me up there, and then I got involved in directing, and it just all happened so organically, and if you are just sitting at home practicing monologues to yourself, you're never going to get anywhere. So get out there and get involved. Good advice, guys. Way to go. <laughs> Thank you, sweetheart. And, Thank you. Uh, my question is, what is the longest Ed Elric short rant you have ever done? <laughs> uh, the, the longest one I did was actually a ringtone that I made. <laughs> um, does anybody have it? Yeah. Uh, that was the longest one. I kind of made one up. But, you know, who says short that he can't answer the phone or it's too because it's on the counter and he's too short to reach up there or something like that? I don't even remember. But it was a long one. Um, but those, you know, those are rough. Yeah, they're rough. I, we only, if we're lucky, we only do them once. Because with all, you know, all the yelling, you just kind of want to practice the line, practice it, make sure you can get it all in uh, without having to do it too many times. But, uh, yeah, uh, the very first episode was probably one of the longer ones, you know. But uh, Shorty, can a Shorty do this, you know? Um, what else do you want to call me? A half pint beans sprout midget? I'm still growing, you backwater desert idiots or something like that. <laughs> A little more exciting than that, but that's, I think that was one of the longest ones. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you. We've got about five minutes, I think, you guys, left in our panel. Um, seven minutes, so uh, we'll see how many, how many questions we can get through. Hi. Hi, Alyssa. Hi, Alyssa. Hi, Alyssa. Hi, Alyssa. Hi, Alyssa. Yes, baby girl. <laughs> I don't think I can do it any better than you. You are adorable. You know what? I'm not short. I'm fun sized.
<laughs> what is your question, darling? For us. I actually have a question for Dick. Okay. Because I, on YouTube, um, the donut story. <laughs> 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 and, um, I, I was wondering what you would do if a fan were to ever come up to you and offer you a sugar donut. <laughs> oh, sweetheart, that's happened 500 times. I have been given so many donuts, I could start a donut company. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, it, that's one of those funny things, like you telling him to go, I love dogs. You just do it at the time, and it doesn't really seem like much, and then you tell somebody the story, and it kind of becomes so much more than it was. I was actually working with Colleen. We were recording the other brothers. I of the donuts. Yeah, we were recording Other Brothers Elric, that episode with the fake brothers, and Ed gets punched in the face, and we're like, well, it would probably sound a little better, because his face is all swollen if we put, like, something in my cheek. So the donut seemed like the logical choice at the time. And, uh, and now, like, that story's been told so many times, uh, but I, I don't eat donuts anymore. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so... Laura trains them at home. Oh. You guys know that Lust and Mustang are married. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So they're Lusting. Yeah. 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 I would say my favorite character was Al, just because I just kind of fell in love. I, I'm an only child, and I always thought if I could have any kind of sibling, I would want it to be a younger brother. I mean, an older sister would be fun, a younger sister would be fun, older brother, but younger brother, I think, would be my favorite um, sibling if I could choose. So to kind of have, uh, you know, a, a younger brother or feel like I did, um, I would say, I would say Al would be my favorite. But then I, after what happened with Envy, um, what an amazing character right. in the original series, and the, the tragic uh, nature of Envy, and uh, that character was a really compelling character for me. Yeah, yeah same here. I, I, both of yours, like, I, I couldn't choose between, but I, I love the character of Al. I think Al is, uh, it, it's, children in particular are, I think, portrayed more convincingly in, in animated features or animated series, because there's something about, I don't know, for me, I, I just remember, has anyone here, here ever seen a film called Brave of the Fireflies? Oh, oh my god. One of the most heartbreaking films ever, and it's, you know, it, there's a small toddler in it, and that was when it hit me years ago, watching that, wow, that is, that is so, you can only really achieve that with an animated, you know, animation with, with an actor doing the voice. And, and I think Al is, is that kind of creation, I think Al is just a very convincing, 
you know, young person and, and, and his, his plight, their relationship with Ed, the whole thing is extraordinarily moving. I mean, they're the heart and soul of the show. But I also freaking love Envy. I think Envy is a really marvelous, villainous creation. I mean, there's such depth there. And as it gets going, the layers that come away and what you're allowed to see is really, I mean, your, your opinion of, your fundamental relationship to that character just stays kind of the same, I suppose. But, but your regard for Envy changes. And, and you, 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 you have complex feelings when it's all turned on, right, which is right, what I love. Right. I love a character that always surprises you. Okay, yeah. thank you, and happy early birthday, Vic. Thank and you, baby. <laughs> even if it's near the end, I want that guy to be able to ask his question because he let me go in front so I can say one. Oh, oh, that's really sweet. Okay, that we gotta rush on. Yeah, this will be the last, the last one because we're out of time. So sorry, but you're a sweet girl. There. Thank you for it. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Hey guys, what's up? Hi. Uh, first, sorry. So you didn't miss this. Uh, first of all, Vic, uh, just want you to know having a little brother, not what's cracked up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, apparently my little brother is better than yours. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, this might be a bit of a darker question. It, it pertains to the homunculi from Brotherhood, because unfortunately I haven't seen the original series yet. Only Brotherhood, I'm sorry. Okay. But which homunculi do you identify the most with? Not who's your favorite, who do you identify the most with? Oh, good question. I like villains, so. <laughs> Yeah. I don't want to identify myself with a bad guy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, pass. <laughs> I, 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 it's, yeah, it's hard. They're all the whole nature of all of them is interesting because they're kind of like they're kind of like the worst, most basest like emotions right. or ideas like personified. And that's why I think they're all so fascinating, is because you go at them going, okay, well, this is in me, this is free, this is you know, they're except for the ten, basically. And, but they become so much more complex than your initial idea of what those sins or those, those bad traits, you know, they become more human, really. Their motivations are very human, and I think it makes, I think, I think everyone can identify with all of them. Uh, because, and I think it's a credit, again, to just how remarkable the show is in general, is that it can make you relate to just these really fantastical characters that otherwise you'd be like, if someone were to describe them to you, you'd be like, well, that sounds really cool and I can appreciate it. You kind of get inside of their heads in a very uncomfortable way, which is precisely why the show is so dramatically satisfying. So I don't know, I can, I can tell that I, I relate to one or the other. I think it can relate to, it's a credit to the, the show itself, but I think at any given point in time I can relate to whichever one is in front of me at the moment yeah. because of the way the story unfolds for all of them. Doesn't it feel like they all have daddy issues? I feel like that is a <laughs> defining characteristic. Uh, of, why did you know me? Of, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm sure we can all relate to that way that she yeah, yeah. yeah. And, they're, and, and they all have their own tragic quality, you know, I mean, they, they are what they are, but there's a reason behind it, and it makes you kind of feel for them. Yeah. It makes them deeper, less, not just one dimension. You guys, we're going to be here tomorrow, right? Are we going to be here tomorrow? Do you have, did you want to add something to me? We're going to be here tomorrow. <laughs> I just want you guys to know, if we haven't gotten to meet you yet, please come and find us tomorrow. Yes. We'll be here tomorrow, and thanks for coming to our panel. Thanks we love you. you.